this is Pastor Roy Blight. We're coming to you again to you today. We're talking about Torah Tuesday. This is Torah Tuesday. We're going to be discussing this week's Torah portion, which is Yitro, which means Jethro. And we're we're looking at it again. We're be, we always begin with the New Covenant uh, because we we want to get the context of exactly what spiritual uh, idea is being given in the Torah portions. And you see uh, the, the consistency throughout the Scripture. But when we look at the Torah portion, it means we're talking about today in Jethro when God comes down. And it's and don't be thrown by the, the subject matter of Jethro because it's very expansive. And we're going to get into it today when God comes down. And, and looking at our, our uh, Torah portion and uh, today, it's it's very interesting and it's very informative. In, in special in special ways because remember that God has come down to us and then God coming down to us we see and we recognize that the Lord is with us and sometimes we lose we lose focus of that fact but when God came down it says in in the Gospel of John chapter 16 when he the spirit of truth is come he will guide you into all truth God's not far away. The spirit of truth is always here with us. And as you learn to walk in faith, God has come down and he's with you now. He'll He's with us even to the end of the age, as the scripture says. So I'm looking at our new covenant in Jethro today. We're looking at a couple portions in Matthew that we want to touch upon. The first one is found in Matthew chapter 8, where that says, When Jesus entered Capernaum, a centurion approached him and appealed to him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, suffering dreadfully. Jesus said to him, I, I will come and, and cure him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was astonished and said to those following him, I tell you the truth, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. And remember, this is a, a portion of scripture. He's talking about a Gentile. He's talking about a pagan Roman soldier, one of the despised enemy of Israel. But Jesus had never seen faith like his in action in all the land that he that the people should have had faith. It says in Matthew 8, 11, and 12, I say to you that many will come from the east and west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the, son, <clears throat> but the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness in that place where the, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So understand that this is an important subject that we need to understand. Then Jesus said to the centurion, go, let it be done just as you believed it would. And a servant was healed at that moment. So we see the Lord is always acting. We see the faith of the centurion man. Yeshua, we see in this portion today that Yeshua heals many in Matthew chapter 8. And we see the cost of following Yeshua discussed also in Matthew chapter 8. It says, and when Yeshua entered Peter's house, he saw his mother-in-law lying sick with a fever. He touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she rose and began to serve him. That evening, they brought to him many who were oppressed by demons, and he cast out the spirits with the word and healed all who were sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illnesses and bore our diseases. Remember, we're looking at the subject matter today. God came down, and God was in the midst of his people, and he's doing mighty one, miracles, wonders, and signs. Now, when Jesus, Yeshua, saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side. And a scribe came up and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. You see, this is on the other side of the Jordan here. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. So we see that, the, you know, here's Jesus as a man walking amongst the people. This is God on planet Earth. And it says, and, and behold, a man came up to him, saying, Teacher, 
what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, which ones? And Yeshua said, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, All these I have kept. What do I still lack? Yeshua said to him, If you would go, if you would be perfect, go, sell what you possess, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. Now when the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Yeshua said to his disciples, Truly, I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. So we see this, 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 this picture that the Lord gives of a camel that could never go through the eye of a needle. An eye of a needle, this is a portion of the gate that is on the outside of a city. Now, when the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. He wants you to understand he's with you, and with him, all things are possible. And when you can get your faith geared up to where it needs to be, you will see that indeed all things are possible. So don't stop living by faith. Peter answered him, we have left everything to follow you. What then will there be left before us? Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. At the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my namesake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. How glorious. But many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. You see, as we look at our Torah portion today, and we understand we how, how to apply this, remember that God is among us. The Lord has come down. He has been in our midst, and he is in our midst even today. His spirit is in us. His spirit is with us. And indeed, Jesus is here with you right now. And we see this, we apply this, we have to understand that even in the Torah, which we're going to be looking at in a few moments, and in the New Covenant, it's always the same principle. Do you hear God's voice? Do you know he's with you right now? What is your relationship like with the Lord? These are the things that have to be taken into account. You see, the first actual Pentecost happened at Mount Sinai. When you look at what happened in the Old Covenant, we the, the in Acts chapter 2, this was actually something that went on at the first Sinai when God was there with them. Long before the tongues of fire fell upon the believers in Jerusalem, the fire fell upon Mount Sinai. The children of Israel arrived in the desert of Sinai in the third month, as the Torah says. On the sixth day of the third month, God descended onto Mount Sinai to give Israel the Torah. He came in blazing fire, heralded by the loud blast of the shofar. Just as Passover now memorializes the exodus from Egypt, Pentecost memorializes the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai. For that reason, Pentecost is called the festival of the giving of the Torah in Judaism to this day. Now, to commemorate the day that he gave his Torah to Israel, the Lord commanded the children of Israel to observe the day of Shavuot, or Pentecost, as an appointed time. Now, most believers know the story of Pentecost, the mighty wind, the tongues of fire, the Holy Spirit, and the apostles speaking in every language. Most, however, are unaware of the significant background of Mount Sinai behind the story. And it's something that everyone that is a follower of Jesus needs to understand. At Mount Sinai, the whole mountain shook and trembled as the sound of, the, of a loud shofar split the air. God spoke and all Israel heard his voice. 
At, as the disciples of the risen Messiah gathered to celebrate Shavuot in Jerusalem, they were gathering to celebrate the anniversary of the giving of the Torah. This is what the Feast of Pentecost is all about. Remember, three times a year, the, the men of Israel had to come into Jerusalem for the feast seasons. Pentecost was one of the feasts. The festival that, that year already carried heightened significance for the disciples of Yeshua, occurring 50 days after the day of their master's resurrection. So Jesus, when he was crucified, this is now 50 days after the resurrection, and they're in Pentecost, and this is when the, the pouring outpouring of the Holy Spirit occurred. The Shavuot miracles that accompanied the giving of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2 take us back to the giving of the Torah at Sinai, the mighty wind, the tongues of fire, and the speaking in other tongues. These commemorate the giving of the Torah as well as the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Those two, those two times, the, out, the giving of the law of Mount Sinai and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit are completely tied together. And this is called Shavuot, which, which is also known as Pentecost. Now, during temple times, Shavuot was observed as both an agricultural festival and a celebration of the giving of the Torah. And when you see this, you understand. It says that as one of the three pilgrimage festivals, Jews from all over the world would come to Jerusalem to celebrate and reaffirm their commitment to the covenant of Moses. It says in Exodus 23, three times you shall keep a feast to me in the year. You shall keep the feast of, a, of unleavened bread. You shall eat, you, sh you shall not eat unleavened bread. Uh, you shall eat unleavened bread. Uh, for seven days, as I commanded you, and, and the time appointed in the month of Abib, for in it you came out of Egypt. N none shall appear before me empty. And the feast of harvest, Shavuot, which is what we're talking about now, the first fruits of your labors, which you have sown in the field, and the feast of ingathering, Sukkot, at the end of the year, when you have gathered in the fruit of your labors from the field, three times in the year, all your males shall appear before the Lord and shall appear before the Lord, of course, in Jerusalem. Now, the festival of Shavuot serves as a type and a shadow. The new covenant, the Brit Hadashah, reveals that Shavuot is the climax of God's plan for our deliverance through Yeshua, Jesus the true Lamb of God. Since the command is to celebrate seven weeks after the Sabbath of the week of Passover, the countdown to Shavuot is part of the tradition of Passover. We count down the days of the Omer, and the 50th day marks the completion of the Omer. For believers in Yeshua, Jesus, the countdown to Shavuot represents the anticipation of the gift from the Father to mankind. It was on this very day that the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, was given to the body of Messiah. Again, these two are always linked. On the first day, on the first day, the Jews from around the world gathered in Jerusalem to reaffirm their commitment to the covenant of Moses and their identity as the holy people of God. The promised Holy Spirit descended upon the believers in Jerusalem to offer a life empowered by the Spirit to all those who would believe. It says in Acts 1, and being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not, not many days from now. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So we see that these, these two are linked. Now, an underlying theme of the Feast of Shavuot, Pentecost, is the coming in of the nations, the Gentiles. The sign to the first Jewish believers in Yeshua that the nations were also being called to salvation was the baptism of the Holy Spirit manifesting among the non-Jewish believers. They, too, had received the promise of the Father. It says, as you observe each of the feasts of the Lord, You'll, as you observe each of the feasts of the Lord, you will find amazing things embedded in the ancient Jewish traditions. 
in many of the traditions that have been passed down from generation to generation, now that we have God's plan revealed to us, we see that the Jews have been having dress rehearsals year after year, preparing their hearts and minds for truths that have now been revealed with the coming of the kingdom of Yeshua HaMashiach. Many of the religious Jews or many of the Jews period don't get it because their eyes have not yet been opened to their own Messiah. But as believers in Jesus, we see it fully. The feasts are filled with all kinds of truths about the death, burial, and resurrection of the true Messiah, about his coming back, about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. All of it is amazing, and we see it as our eyes are open to what God is showing us. Now, a beautiful example of this is repeated annually in the synagogues around the world at Shavuot. Because it is the time of the barley harvest in Israel, it's a tradition, it's tradition to read the book of Ruth at one of the services that have to do with Pentecost. Are you familiar with the story of Ruth? You may have quoted, quoted from it during your own wedding ceremony, if you look back and remember it. It says, and Ruth said, and treat me not to leave thee, and to return from following after thee. For whether thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. You may have heard this before, normally at a, at a wedding ceremony, but this is where it is, and it has to do with Pentecost in Judaism today. You see, the Jewish couple, Naomi and Elimelech, had moved to a foreign land, Moab, during a famine. They had settled there and had a family, two sons. The boys married Moabitess girls, but the husbands died, all three, Elimelech and his sons, leaving Naomi and her daughters-in-law with no way of supporting themselves. Naomi had no choice but to return to her home in Bethlehem. Remember, it was, it was, it was a famine time. There were There among her own people, she understood their ways, and maybe she could figure out a way to survive. She urged her daughters-in-law to return to their parents' homes, since she could not promise them a future with her at all. One daughter-in-law kissed Naomi and said goodbye. But this is where Ruth made her famous plea that we just read. She would go with Naomi. She would not be denied. You see, you see, you have to understand that God has not left you without a Redeemer. This is the point that we see in Ruth that is always celebrated when we read Ruth and when we celebrate Pentecost. Naomi was from Bethlehem. And in Bethlehem, Naomi directed Ruth to glean grain that had been dropped by the harvesters in the field of one of her late husband's close relatives, a man named Boaz. Ruth, get, Ruth gained a reputation of being loyal and hardworking as she looked after the needs of not only herself, but of her late husband's mother as well. Even though she was a foreigner from a pagan land, she was a Moabite, she was not from that country. Boaz began showing Ruth favor, allowing her to eat lunch with her, his harvesters, instructing them to drop grain on purpose for her to be able to glean and sending her home with leftovers from lunch, as well as an apron full of grain. Naomi knew they needed to make a move. There is, a, there is the law in Torah that a near kinsman has the option of taking over a dead man's property and even raising a family in the name of the dead man to further his name. Naomi recognized Boaz as the perfect kinsman redeemer. She instructed Ruth, as to how to draw Boaz's attention to this option and then set the plan in motion. Boaz took the bait, drew up the deal, and soon Ruth and Boaz were the proud parents of a bouncing baby boy, Obed, the father of Jesse, the father of David, the father of Mary, the mother of Yeshua. And this is a very famous story we know where God has fulfilled so many things. It says in Matthew 1, Abraham begot Isaac, Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Judah and his brothers. Judah begot Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Perez begot Hezron, and Hezron begat Ram. Ram begat Aminadab. Aminadab begot Nashon, and Nashon begot Salmon. Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab. Boaz begot Obed by Ruth. Obed begot Jesse. And Jesse begot David the king.
So we see that that this is the the book of Ruth is a fulfillment of something that is very large, and it is the fulfilling of what God does when He comes among us, which takes us into our Torah portion, parasha number seventeen, which is Yitro, which is Jethro. And we're, as we look at this, we realize that God, when he is among us, is doing great things. And this is our Torah portion today is from Exodus 18, 1 to 20, 23. Now, we see that Jethro was the father-in-law of Moses. And it's being named Jethro, which is the literal Hebrew translation behind the name Jethro, of course. The title comes from the first words of the first verse of the reading, which says, now Jethro the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God had done for, for Moses and for Israel, his people, how the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. And of course, it was miraculous, especially when you were living in that day and you were living in the land of Midian. The portion tells the story of Jethro's visit to the camp of Israel, then relates the great theophany at Mount Sinai, where God gives Israel the Ten Commandments and invites the people to enter a special covenant relationship with him there. And this is the central theme of this, that the Lord wants to establish his relationship with his people, and he wants to do it with every one of us. Last week's Torah portion, Beshalach told how Pharaoh's armies pursued the children of Israel, but were drowned in the Red Sea by the hand of the Lord. Initially, delighted over their new freedom from bondage, the rescued nation soon began complaining about the hardships of life in the desert. The Lord was gracious, however, and provided water and manna from heaven to meet the people's needs. And we see that this, this was their life and it was going on in the wilderness. Now, Father Moses' father-in-law Jethro, Yithro, had heard how God had blessed his son-in-law and his kinsmen by delivering them from their oppression in Egypt. And so as they were heading south, southeast uh, in the, into the uh, wilderness of Shur, the, which is actually the land of Midian, uh, Jethro bumped into Moses there. Jeff, Jethro went to Rephidim to meet with Moses and Israel. Remember the last scene of the last Torah portion, the children of Israel had this great battle at Rephidim with the Amalekites. Now Jethro shows up at Rephidim, and he, and he wanted to meet with Moses and, of course, with all Israel. Jethro also brought Moses' wife, Zipporah, and his two sons, Gershom and Eleazar, all of whom had apparently returned to Midian before the exodus of the Israelites. So they've been away from their father and their, and their husband. Upon their reunion, Moses told his father-in-law that all that the Lord had done to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake. Moses also told them of all the hardships that had come upon them in the way and how God had delivered them. Jethro rejoiced, blessed the Lord, and offered sacrifices, which were then communally eaten with Moses' brother Aaron and the elders of the Israelites. It says in Exodus 18, So Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord, who delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of Pharaoh, and who delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all the gods. Indeed, it was proven when they dealt proudly against the people. Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and other sacrifices to God, and Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law in the presence of God. So we see that this reunion is taking place. The following day, upon seeing Moses beset with the concerns of the people, Jethro wisely advised that a hierarchy of judges could help him bear the burden of governing the Israelites. We saw in the previous verses that there were elders of Israel who Moses met with and included in important events, yet Moses was taking all the responsibility of counseling the people upon himself. It says, what you are doing is not good. This is words of Jethro. You and the people with you will certainly wear yourselves out, for the thing is too heavy for you. You are not able to do it alone. You shall provide out of all the people able men which will fear God, men of truth, hating unjust gain, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. Let them be judged let them judge the people at all times. 
You see, this would free Moses to be a more effective intercessor before the Lord. Moses listened to his father-in-law and did everything that he said. He chose capable men from all Israel and made them leaders of the people, officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. And they judged the people at all times, the hard cases they brought to Moses, but every small matter they decided themselves. Moses agreed to his father-in-law's advice, and then Jethro returned to his home in Midian. Jethro was highly revered in Hebrew tradition as a Gerasetic, a righteous convert. Ironically, in Jewish tradition, Yitro is considered the father of the Sanhedrin, the, the, the political and religious rulers of Israel or of Judea later on. So we see the giving of the Torah is now given at Mount Sinai. After the third new moon after leaving Egypt, the first day of the month of Sivan, the Israelites encamped opposite Mount Sinai, the place where Moses was initially commissioned by the Lord. Moses ascended the mountain, and there God commanded him to tell the leaders that if they would obey the Lord and keep his covenant, then they would be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And after he delivered this message to the people, they responded by proclaiming all that the Lord has spoken, we shall do. And this is done several times. Then the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and, and consecrate them today, and tomorrow they must wash their clothes. The Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will come to you in a dense cloud, so that the people will hear when I speak with you, and they will always put their trust in you. And Moses relayed to the Lord what the people had said. Moses, told, Moses was told to command the people to sanctify themselves before the Lord descended upon the mountain in three days. And the people were to abstain from worldly comforts and not so much as touch, under penalty of death, the boundaries of the mountain. It says, For on the third day the Lord will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. You shall set bounds for the people all around, saying, Take heed to yourselves that you do not go up to the mountain or touch its base. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. Not a hand shall touch him but he shall surely be stoned or shot with an arrow, whether man or beast. He shall not live. When the trumpet sounds long, they shall come near the mountain. Be ready for the third day, for on the third day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. And, and on that day, God stepped down from the heavens and onto the top of Mount Sinai. There, there was wind. There was lightning. There was thunder, there was smoke, there was fire. The voice of God was audibly heard by the entire nation when he spoke the Ten Commandments. This event took place exactly 50 days after the day of the exodus from Egypt. It was the original Shavuot, the original Pentecost. And when we see this going on, it's a mighty day indeed. The festival of Shavuot, superimposes the giving of the Spirit in Jerusalem over the giving of the Torah at Sinai. The two events are forever inseparably linked. Now, according to the scholars, the sixth of Sivan was a Shabbat, and the Israelites awoke to loud claps of thunder, streaks of lightning, smoky fire surrounding Mount Sinai. On Shabbat morning, the sixth of Sivan, exactly seven weeks after the Exodus, all the children of Israel gathered at the foot of Mount Sinai, where Jehovah descended amidst thunder, lightning, billowing smoke, fire, and the voluminous blast of the shofar. The sound of a shofar grew louder and louder until terror gripped the hearts of the people. And we see that this is all taking place at the Lord's, at the Lord's behest. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, 
and the whole mountain quaked greatly. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him by voice. Then the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down and warn the people, lest they break through, the, break through to gaze at the Lord, and many of them perish. Also, let the priests who come near the Lord consecrate themselves, lest the Lord break out against them. But Moses said to the Lord, The people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for you warned us, saying, Set bounds around the mountain and consecrate it. Then the Lord said to him, Away, get down and then come up, and you and Aaron with you. But do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to the Lord, lest he break out against them. So Moses went down to the people and spoke to them. The Lord then spoke all the Ten Commandments. And this is when they, they got it audibly and everybody heard it. Now, the, the, we need to understand that, that they're in the law of Moses, there are 613 laws or mitzvot. And we need to understand the learning to connect with God is what God had given to them in Mount Sinai. Now, the meaning of the word mitzvah is connection. God always wants to connect with his people. The purpose of Torah is to teach us how to connect, how to have relationships, in particular, our relationship with the Lord. The 613 mitzvot can ultimately all be summed up in the 10 commandments, the 10 mitzvot, and the 10 can be summed up in these two. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment, and the second is like, namely, this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is, there is none other commandment greater than these, said the Lord himself. Now pic picture the commandments written on the two tablets. One tablet on the one side could have had the first five commandments, and they teach us how to relate to our creator, God and our parents. The tablet on the other side with the other five teaches us how to relate to each other. If we superimpose one tablet onto the other, they line up, and each pair of corresponding commandments instills a single principle. Commandment number one, corresponding with six, two, and seven. Number three, with eight, and so on, giving us a total of five basic principles of how to connect with others. These principles become our five challenges. The first challenge, commandments one and six. It's found in Exodus chapter 20. I am the Lord your God, who rescued you from the land of Egypt, the place of your slavery. You must not have any other God but me. That's verses 2 and 3. You must not murder. Verse 13. Both of these commandments teach us to recognize that there is one God, and you're not he. Our second challenges are, are commandments 2 and 7. You must not make for yourself an idol or a... You must not make yourself make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other God. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected. Even the children in the third and the fourth generations of those who reject me. But I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love me and obey my command commands. You must not commit adultery. In the prophets, God's, God often equates idolatry with, with adultery or sexual sin. Both of these commandments teach us to recognize that in both our covenant with God and our covenants with our spouses, from God's perspective, we are set apart for each other. We learn that it is important to respect that about other marriages as well. Each person who has entered a lifelong covenant is set apart from all others and keeps himself or herself in faithfulness to the one with whom he or she has taken the vows. So this comes down to love and respect and caring for one another. Our, our third challenge is found in Commandments 3 and 8. 
You must not misuse the name of the Lord your God. The Lord will not let you go unpunished if you misuse his name. You must not steal. The better translation of the Hebrew word is kidnap in, in Exodus 20, 15. Both of these commandments teach us to respect what the other person in the relationship values. The fourth challenge is found in Commandments 4 and 9. Remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day of rest dedicated to the Lord your God. On that day, no one in your household may do any work. This includes you, your sons and daughters, your male and female servants, your livestock, and any foreigners living with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and everything in them. But on the seventh day, he rested. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart as holy. You must not testify falsely against your neighbor. In this challenge, we're, we're faced with one call to fall in line with a community-wide commitment and another to deal justly with all people. It covers everything. Now, once we have developed the kind of integrity it takes to build relationships that are God-centered with faithfulness and respect for each other, able to put aside our own desires and always valuing justice, an amazing thing happens. This integrity we have begun to develop starts to spill over and affect the way we handle every aspect of our lives, the way we connect with others in our community and in the world, and we become a light in the darkness. And then our fifth challenge, Commandments 5 and 10. Honor your father and mother. Then you will live a long, full life in the land the Lord your God is giving you. That's Exodus 20, 12. You must not covet your neighbor's house. You must not cover your neighbor's wife, male or female servant, ox or donkey, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. Both of these commandments teach God's people to appreciate the uniqueness of God's plan for our lives and our mission. We are to be content, happy, and grateful for the Creator's design. The degree to which you appreciate your uniqueness is the degree to which you experience happiness. When God spoke these commandments, the heavens and the earth trembled. And we see that this was before all the people. There was thunder and lightning. The English translation of Exodus 20, 18 concludes the Ten Commandments story. And all the people saw the thunder and lightning. However, the original Hebrew of Exodus 20, 18 says something quite different. In the Hebrew, the verse literally reads, and all the people saw the voices and the torches. Know that it's, notice that it says, and all the people saw the voices. Most translations smooth out the Hebrew by translating the word voices as thunder which agrees with the context of the thunder and lightning in Mount Sinai, what the Hebrew really says, they saw the voices and the torches. What does it mean, the people saw voices? How do you see a sound? How does one see a voice? What are the torches and from where did they come? In Deuteronomy, Moses retells the story of hearing God's voice at Sinai. In 10 different passages, he repeatedly reminds Israel that they heard God's voice speak to them from out of the fire. One ancient Jewish legend explains that as God's voices spoke, it split into a multitude of sparks going forth. His voice came to them as fire. Therefore, the torches of Exodus 20.18 are explained as the very fiery words of God that came to each person individually, very similar to the book of Acts. So let's consider then the events that occurred in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2. It says, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a mighty, of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, and one sat, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So we see that there's tongues of fire here. And it's important to note some things. The parasha ends with the terrified Israelites still pleading and beseeching Moses to be their mediator lest they die before the presence of God. 
So this experience really shook people up. It says, then they said to Moses, you speak with us and we will hear, but let not God speak with us lest we die. And Moses said to the people, do not fear for God has come to test you and that his fear may be before you so that you may not sin. The people stood afar off while Moses alone drew near in the thick darkness where God was. And we see that this is taking place. At Mount Sinai was, was the altar because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mount and Moses went up. So this is where God told Moses to come up and he did. On the morning of the third day, the 6th of Sivan, exactly seven weeks after the Exodus, all the children of Israel were gathered at the foot of Mount Sinai, where the Lord had descended amidst thunder, lightning, billowing smoke, fire, and the voluminous blast of the shofar. Moses ascended, but the Lord told him to go back down and warn the people, including the priests, not to set foot on the mountain lest they be consumed with the wrath of the Lord. The Lord then declared the fountain of moral conduct required of the people, which is known to us today as the Ten Commandments. One, you shall, you shall have no other gods before me. Two, you shall not make any graven image to bow to it. Three, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Four, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Five, honor your father and mother. Six, you shall not murder. Seven, you shall not commit adultery. Eight, you shall not steal. Nine, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Ten, you shall not covet. So we see that this ends our Torah portion today with the Ten Commandments and the children of Israel in the wilderness. Now let's go to the half Torah and see what the Lord has for us there as we begin to close up today. This is found in Isaiah chapter 6 through chapter 9. And we see the prophet Isaiah is actually meeting the Lord. The Lord is coming down to meet with Isaiah. It says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces. With two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. So, the, so Mo, Isaiah was very fearful. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin is purged. I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. And God said, Go, say to that people, Hear, indeed, but do not understand. See, indeed, but do not grasp. Dull that people's minds, stop its ears and seal its eyes, lest seeing with its eyes and hearing with its ears, it also, it, it also grasps with its mind and repent and save itself. So you see, we're looking at the Holy One of Israel coming before his people. The scholars connected Israel's acceptance of the covenant at Mount Sinai, all that the Lord had said that we will do, with the response of the prophet Isaiah to the Lord's question, whom shall I send, and who will go before us? Isaiah's answer, here I am, was the same root word used by both Moses and Samuel when they had encountered the Lord. God commissioned Isaiah to go tell the people, listen again and again, but do not, un but do not understand. Look again and again, but do not see. As with Pharaoh, the heart of the listeners would be hardened and the message would be dis the message would be discarded. When Isaiah asked how long he should preach, the Lord said, "Until their cities are all destroyed and their people are exiled from the land." Nevertheless, a holy seed would remain from which the people would one day 
be regenerated. The hand of the Lord was raised against Israel in judgment. Foreign troops would be coming, but if God's people wound, but if God's people would call upon him, he would fight for them. It says in Isaiah 7, Moreover, the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. Then he said, Hear now, O house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary men, but you will not weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and call him Emmanuel. And, then the, and when the Messiah comes, he will set up his kingdom. He will be our counselor. He will be in charge of the government, and we will have peace. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders, and, and he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. It says in John 1, and it's talking about God coming down to us. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And out of his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. We see that this, this amazing uh, relationship that Isaiah had it was further uh, expounded upon because you have to understand that Moses, Isaiah, and the disciples they all experienced God coming down to them. They all experienced this, the, the under, they all had the understanding that God was with them, that God was ministering in their midst, and God would always be with them. Our God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So with that, we're going to uh, stop our uh, broadcast for today on this Torah Tuesday, and I pray that this message uh, ministered to you. And some of these things that are so profound, but just keep this in mind. The Lord is always near at hand, and his hand is upon his people. So have faith and trust in the living God who is there with us at all times. God bless. Have a great day, and we'll talk to you next time.